me, Marty. I'm sorry, I don't believe I know him all. It's because I'm from the future, Doc. I don't have time for this right now. No, wait. Doc, you gotta believe me, I'm from the future. Well, all right then, prove it, future boy. I know what happened to you this morning. You were standing on the toilet hanging a clock when you hit your head on the sink, and you got a vision of the flux capacitor, and that's how time travel's possible. How did you know that? Because I got here in a time machine that you invented, and I need your help to get back to the year 1985. Great Scott! So if the DeLorean time machine runs on the flux capacitor, then it's electrical, yes? Yeah, you said that it runs on, like, 1.21 gigawatts. 1.21 gigawatts?! 1.21 gigawatts! Doc, what the hell is a gigawatt? How could I have been so careless? 1.21 gigawatts! How am I gonna generate that kind of power? It can't be done, can it? Doc, all we need is like a little plutonium. Oh, I'm sure that in 1985, plutonium is sold at every corner drugstore, but in 1955, it's a little hard to come by. I'm sorry, Marty, but I'm afraid you're stuck here. Doc, I can't be stuck here. I got a life in 1985. I got a girl. Is she pretty? Yes. I mean, look what she wrote about me. This says it all. Marty, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. Doc, you're my only hope. I'm sorry, Marty, but the only power source capable of generating 1.21 gigawatts is a bolt of lightning. Wait, what did you say? A bolt of lightning! Unfortunately, you never know when or where it's ever gonna strike. We do now. That's it! If we can somehow transfer the electricity that strikes the clock tower into the flux capacitor at exactly 10.04 p.m. next Saturday night, it just might work. Next Saturday night, I'm sending you back to the future. But what elements am I going to use? I've got it. I'll use silicon and boron. An odd choice, I know, but I've got an idea. Here, Marty, come with me. Stop, you're really on it. No, Marty, the more you know about this experiment, the better. Come on. You see, Marty, silicon is a semiconductor, which means it has the conductivity between that of an insulator and that of most metals. Because of this, it is an essential component for electronic devices. Well, I'll also include a couple more numbers, so you can get a better feel for where this element is located on the periodic table. Here's the atomic number, and here's the electron configuration, and the average atomic mass. Doc, I'm not much of a numbers guy. Don't worry, Marty, then I'll give you a visual. Here you go, a picture of silicon. As you can see, Marty, pure silicon is a hard, dark gray solid with a metallic shine. It's relatively inactive at room temperature. Is every piece of silicon the same? Well, not necessarily. There are actually four isotopes of silicon, three of which are stable. Those three are silicon-28, silicon-29, and silicon-30. But silicon-32 is a radioactive isotope containing 18 neutrons. It's formed from a reaction between cosmic radiation and atmospheric argon. That sounds awesome, Doc, but I bet there's, like, not much silicon on Earth. How are we gonna find it? No, Marty. Silicon is the second most abundant element on Earth. Next to oxygen, of course. Seriously? Yes. Silicon may not be found pure in nature, but it can be found in sand, quartz, and even rock crystal. It literally makes up 25.7% of the Earth's crust just by weight. That's heavy, Doc. Yes, it is, Marty. It's even considered the eighth most abundant element in the entire universe. Wow, that's pretty amazing. What about boron? Well, I can't really say the same for boron. You see, Marty, boron has a very low abundance in both the Earth's crust and throughout the solar system. So we won't be able to find any? Well, chemically uncombined boron can be found in small amounts in meteoroids. But yes, pure boron can't be found in nature. Here, Marty, I'll give you a picture so you can better visualize boron. At normal room temperature, boron is a solid. The picture you're looking at is its silver-gray metal-like form, but it also has a dark brown form that looks sort of like a black powder. It should also be noted that one of its isotopes, boron-10, is also a good absorber of neutrons and is used in the control rods of nuclear reactors. But before I get ahead of myself, let me write down a couple of numbers like the atomic number, electron configuration, and the average atomic mass. Marty, it's a good thing you landed here in 1955 and didn't go any further. Had you done so, you might have wound up in a time when silicon and boron hadn't even been discovered yet. You see, Marty, boron wasn't discovered until 1808 by the French chemist Joseph Louis Gay-Lussac and Louis Jacques Thenard. 
Those same two chemists also discovered an impure form of silicon a couple of years later in 1811, but Johns Jacob Berzelius was credited with the official discovery of silicon in the year 1823. If I can somehow mold these two elements into a metal rod and stick it on the back of the DeLorean, that just might be your one chance to get back to 1985. So let's hope it works. See you in the future, Marty. Doc! Doc! Marty! I just sent you back to 1985! I know. I'm back from the future. Great Scott. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you want me to get you back to 1985 again? No. I need you to get me to 1885. Great Scott.